I think we may start. Uh, it's wonderful to see such a good turnout tonight, and undoubtedly, uh, it's, it, it, uh, hearing Pat Rubin is a wonderful opportunity here at the Courtauld. Uh, and it's a great honor for me to introduce Professor Pat Rubin tonight, who is a honorary fellow at the Courtauld and Professor Emerita at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. Uh, her, her career is very impressive. I will only mention a few things that she has achieved, starting from her, for our students. She has quite, a, quite an extraordinary kind of um, uh, set of institutions where she was trained, BA at Yale, MA at the Courtauld, and PhD at Harvard. Since then, she's held numerous positions and received many honors. Suffice it to say for tonight that she was deputy director here at the Courtauld and director of the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. But most importantly tonight, she was the founder of the research forum that brings her, us, her with us tonight. So it, it's a wonderful, uh, this is a wonderful circumstance for us tonight. Um, Pat's specialist area is Renaissance art, but for her the boundaries of this term are very capacious, both chronologically and conceptually. And I can do no better than citing her own self-presentation in her website at the Institute of Fine Arts, which I recommend everyone to read. And she writes of herself, I work historically on the matter and material of art. That history for me is physical, social, and cultural. It is inherently interdisciplinary and not hierarchical with regard to media or modes of communication. I could not have summarized this, all these uh, important concepts better. It is impossible to do justice to the breadth of past publications here, which range from Dante to 19th century ideas about the Renaissance. Uh, we probably need a conference to discuss all their scholarly contributions. So I will only mention her books. The first, Giorgio Vasari, Art and History, which analyzes, which, with exceptional insightfulness, the grand narrative of the lives. The second, Images and Identity in 15th Century Florence, 2007, which does much to complicate and enrich uh, Baxendale's foundational painting and experience, and to provide a nuanced understanding of the socially constructed ways of seeing and being seen in Renaissance Florence. She's then advanced much the study of uh, 15th and 16th century portraiture and ended up writing a book on the representation of another part of the body in Seen from Behind, Perspectives on the Male Body in Renaissance <coughs> Art. Her many and varied publications and her, and her and unparalleled energy and collegiality <coughs> are a testimony to Bath's generosity, which has inspired generations of scholars here and elsewhere, and we continue to do so today with our paper entitled Like a Rich Jewel in an Ethiop's Ear. Welcome to the <laughs> Thank you, Guido, for that very generous opening. Truth to advertising, yes, it is Titian and the Ethiops here as well. Uh, <laughs> this uh, dual purpose slide. Uh, first, it is of course wonderful for me to be here at the Courtauld, which I do regard as really my academic home in many ways. Also, I'd like to start with a modest disclaimer. What I'm about to talk to you about is the result of what has been a true voyage of discovery for me, actually a form of accidental tourism. It's a, it's a topic I fell into. And I owe many debts of thanks to those who have helped me along the way. 
sharing knowledge and insights. Particularly, I have to thank uh, Neo Beverly Brown, Jim Harris, Paul Hill, Susie Nash, Scott Nethersall, Charles Robertson, Alison Wright, and I also must acknowledge the work of Kate Lowe, whose work on the question of the black African presence in Europe generally and in Venice specifically is both formidably informed and inspirational. All right. When Love Struck Romeo first sees Juliet among all the admired beauties of Verona assembled at the Capulet party, he exclaims that it seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Such contrasts of light and dark are woven throughout Shakespeare's tragedy of star-crossed lovers, providing a metaphorical basis for their story. The simile, however, refers specifically to the prevailing equation of bright and beautiful, which made fair the default description of female beauty. Shakespeare relied on that association in A Midsummer Night's Dream with Lysander's brusque rejection of Hermia, away, you Ethiop, expressing his fairy potion-induced repulsion of his former love. Unhappy and perplexed, she can but respond, I am as fair now as I was erewhile. In both Shakespeare's England and Titian's Venice, Ethiopian was one of a range of designations for Africans, which included Moor, Blackamoor, Saracen, and Negro in English, and their Italian cognates, Etiope, Moro, Moronero, Serracino, and the adjective Negro, among others. Now, let's not lose sight of how to the advance button. Although some of the terms specify black Africans, others, like Ethiopian, Moor, and Saracen, were fluid. The spectrum was geographic, ethnic, religious, and political, but not necessarily, not necessarily, necessarily racial in the sense of attaching identity strictly to skin color. Otherness or alterity was the fundamental discrimination, which might be associated with exotic glamour, or with debased subhuman characteristics. And slide, I show on this slide here for Moro, which you see inscribed toward the top, and for otherness, a study by Paolo Veronese for an altarpiece depicting the martyrdom of St. George, with one of the executioners, or sketched in executioners, brushed dark in brown ink, and with a note above his head, Moro. Uh, this Moro, sorry, I have to figure out my reach here. Uh, <coughs> this Moor is among a group of ethnically demonized figures attacking George, and it was done as a, for detail from the high altar of San Giorgio Braida in Verona, as I say, painted by Paolo Veronese. And you can see the entire group of executioners is given rather demonic airs. This sort of degradation is linked to, a descriptive, tradi to descriptive traditions going back to ancient Greek and Roman writers, with Pliny the Elder's first century AD natural history being the most influential. In the seventh book of his encyclopedic work, Pliny cataloged the prodigies of nature found among remote peoples, asking, who ever believed in Ethiopians before actually seeing them? He further noted that India and parts of Ethiopia especially teem with marvels. Ethiopes, the son of Vulcan, Pliny said, gave the name to the race, commenting that it is by no means surprising that the outermost districts of this region produce animal and human monstrosities, considering the capacity of the mobile element of fire to mold their bodies and carve their outlines. According to Pliny, it was the sun's fire, however, that burnt Ethiopians black, explaining how they were born with scorched appearance. A combination of myth, marvel, monstrosity, and extreme conditions at the extremities of the known world that, quite, that persisted even when the world was reconfigured and newly mapped by the global navigators of the 15th and 16th centuries. And this slide shares a gathering um, of Plinian favorites from Sebastian Munster's Cosmographia, published in ba Basel in 1544. <coughs> so to say that these Plinian ideas had a very long life indeed which uh, would be a whole other topic to trace right up to the 16th century, but I promise you if they were there. Those stereotypes were reinforced in the Christian area, 
M. With black deemed to be the color of sin, the diabolical opposite of the purity of white, a schematic division that somatizes virtue and vice. The assumed equivalence of black and bestial is represented here by Lorenzo Ghiberti's portrayal of a thick-lipped, bulbous-nosed, heavy-jowled attendant to the Magi and the Adoration panel on the north doors of the Florentine Baptistry. A monkey is draped over his shoulder and grasps his tightly curled hair. In direct contrast with that pair, a fine-featured follower of the kings turns his aquiline profile towards them. Both monkey and man signal African origins, a probable allusion to the arrival of the Magi from all corners of the earth. In the 16th century, the heritage of demonization, degradation, and subjugation fed readily into the view of sub-Saharan Africans as abject commodities in the rapidly expanding slave trade. But Africa could also conjure up images of abundant wealth and powerful kings. Here, as depicted in these details, from maps respectively showing the set east and west coast of the continent of, in an atlas uh, or a portland chart dating from between 1558 and 1559 and presumed to have been commissioned by Queen Mary of England as a gift for her husband, Philip II of Spain. It is now in the British Library. Whereas knowledge of West African kings was a relatively recent vintage, and connected with the discovery of new worlds, that of his Ethiopian counterpart, identified as Prester John, dated from the mid-12th century. And I show you, as I say, details from uh, the west and the east coast, and I show you the full maps, and you can see how the king of the west coast is actually heading towards the new world, whereas Prester John is heading towards uh, the Indies. The existence of a Christian priest king, and I show you Prester here, uh, ruler of a vast realm of infinite wealth and great military power, stemmed largely from a letter written sometime between 1165 and 1170 in the name of Prester John and addressed to the Byzantine emperor. With no false modesty, the recipient is asked to believe without doubt that I, Prester John, am Lord of Lords and exceed all kings of the entire earth in virtue, power, and riches, which are under those riches which are under heaven. <coughs> Seventy-two kings are tributaries to us. I am a devoted Christian. Our magnificent magnificence dominates the three Indies. Filled with marvelous details, the letter tells of the king's oath to vanquish the inner enemies of the cross of Christ and actually lead a crusade uh, to the Holy Sepulchre. Apocryphal as it was, the letter was fodder to the uh, uh, crusading zeal and to the taste for exotic tales. It circulated widely over the centuries in Latin and eventually in vernacular translations and in print, including editions in Italian. Prester John's fame did not dim in the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, even in the light of increasingly accurate accounts of African lands, their boundaries, their inhabitants, and their political organization. Here he is proudly portrayed in an engraving dated 1599, and he, here too no, he is, holds his cross as a scepter. In his epic, Orlando Furioso, Ludovico Ariosto tempered the myth with current knowledge in the canto dedicated to the paladin Astolfo's adventures in Ethiopia. And I show you here the frontispiece uh, portrait of Ariosto in the, to the 1532 final revised edition of the Orlando Furioso, engraved after a drawing by Titian. This is a rem reminder that Titian knew Ariosto and his work and I would argue that his concept, Titian's concept, of poetic composition was strongly influenced by Arias, Ariosto's model. The poet details one of Astolfo's journeys, flying on his hippogriff over France, Spain, and Portugal before turning to Africa, 
eventually arriving where the Nile crosses to Asia, then heading to the other Ethiopia on the, uh, on the far side of the Nile. Dismounting, he visits the emperor, who instead of a scepter, again, holds a cross, and who is called Senepo, Ariosto says, by his subjects, while we call him Prester or Petejani. While the panoramic account of Astolfo's itinerary over Europe and North Africa is a model of up-to-date cartography, or cartographic narrative, once he crosses to the Prester John's realm, it enters that ruler's legendary land. Ariosto's descriptions rehearse the oft-repeated marvels, allowing his hero to actually find the elusive king, fully aware of the Portuguese missions that had been sent by their king that had failed to do so. As I said, their research for Prester went on well into the 16th century, although what they expected to find 500 years later is a big question. However, there you have it. He was a very big, abiding, actual, or in the minds of that mythical figure. Throughout the poem, the elusive interlacing of identities and descriptions of chivalric deeds, of classical references, legendary lore, and contemporary knowledge defines Ariosto's poetic strategy, making his work at once relevant in its realism and yet removed to places of fictive delight. Ariosto had no more been to Africa than Titian frequented Ovidian haunts. In that sense, both the poet and the painter who aspired to poetry were dedicated armchair, armchair travelers to impossibly distant places. Places viewed, however, through modern lenses, in a manner demonstrating the ability of both, that is, the poet and the painter, to create pleasurable and plausible poetic fictions. And here I'm showing an illustration to the 15th canto of the Ariosto's poem, which includes both, uh, um, illustrates the verses, but as you see, it illustrates, if you look in the detail, um, how Astolfo is journeying to Africa in a, what would be a very uh, accurate or up-to-date delineation. So this combination of the, the fictive, the imaginary, and the real, which, of which the illustrator was fully aware, and the readers and the viewers. Titian was never called upon to portray Prester John, who was, however, said to be descended from the Magi. But he followed what had become standard iconography in his painting of the three kings from the east, the Cremagi d'Oriente, as he called the canvas that he sent to King Philip II in August 1560, by depicting the youngest of them, Balthazar, with dark skin. There are four principal known versions of the composition associated uh, with the canvas shipped to Philip, which vary among themselves in faction and in attribution to Titian, his shop and subsequent copyists. Of them, that in the Escorial is generally identified as the picture delivered its sign by the Venetian ambassadors to the Spanish king. Um, that said, all four share format and composition. There's a quality of observation in the young king's unidealized features that adds to his exotic characterization. Brandishing his gift like a trophy, and farthest from the Virgin in Christ, he is more thoroughly orientalized by his dress than the other magi. He wears a mamluk hat, and like Shakespeare's poetic Ethiop, has a rich jewel suspended from his ear. Um, the, it's harder to read in the Escorial version, and a terrible slide taken from a not good photograph. However much I have been on my knees to the Escorial, I have not been able to pry out a picture of this picture. However, from the uh, slightly better image from the Ambrosiana version, a version of the Ambrosiana, shows you that he wore a large hooped earring. Now, this is wearing of earrings is not the case of his companion kings in the picture, nor generally in the imagery of the adoration where it is only the black magus who sports earrings, bejeweled hoops, as in Titian's version here, or often white pearl pear drops of the sort seen, for example, here, in Andrea da Sarto's Adoration uh, from Santissima Annunziata. Or that white, that sort of white earring implied in Shakespeare's simile. 
The resilience of the association of Africans with this form of adornment is proven by their occurrence, for example, in Cesare Vecchio's late 16th century costume book, showing a nobly dressed Moro di Condizione with a large hoop earring and that of a half-naked black Moro of Zanzibar uh, sporting an elaborate dangling earring. And these labels, the Moro di Condizione and, and the um, Moro of Zanzibar also demonstrates the wide range, geographic range, and even associative range of the term Moro. Africans, Ethiopians, Sereceni, Morineri, in different roles and different guises, occur in roughly a dozen of Titian's paintings, the number depending on how the versions and attributions are counted. And I show you details uh, from four of them, which I will be discussing in due course. The works span from the earliest stages of Titian's career to his later years, latest years, from the altarpiece commissioned by Jacobo Pizarro in 1519, and that's the more on your far left, uh, to um, Titian's fetch fetching assassins, Judith, Judith and Salome, dating from around 1570, and the far right comes from one of the Salome pictures. This is, the appearance of these figures uh, is as fractional as it is fitful in an oeuvre that totals something over 300 works, once again, depending on the attributional accounting. Yet their pictorial roles are neither incidental nor negligible. And in every case uh, where an ear is visible, there is an earring. Uh, but it is not one of the white pearl earrings of the sort that from the mid-1520s often dangle from the ears of Titian's mythological beauties or from those of his of the fine and noble ladies that he portrayed. <coughs> Ornaments that are variously that variously signal luxury and luscious lasciviousness, and I show you from Isabella d'Este on your left to the Venus of Urbino on your right, with their various with their pearl earrings. And it was from about the mid-1520s uh, that the wearing of uh, pierced ears uh, by such uh, both uh, noble ladies and ladies of this sort uh, became common, uh, had to do with various usages, but also undoubtedly partly with the flooding of the pearl market uh, due to New World, uh, Brazilian particularly, pearl fisheries. Uh, so this sort of pearl glut. But that's quite another story. The earrings, seemingly minor signs of difference, constitute a form of costume coding by Titian, making those of African, marking those of African origins. It is a distinction whose consistency across genres and over time calls attention to the inconsistencies and complexities involved in the multifaceted and historically conditioned notions of Africa and its people available to 16th century Venetians simultaneously modern realities and mythological figments of the Venetian imagination. Now, there were a number of ways that the artist could encounter Africans. An embassy from the kingdom of Ethiopia brought a deputation to Venice in 1402, its members bearing exotic gifts, arousing curiosity, and being officially received. Christian Ethiopians continued to pass through the city on pilgrimage. That said, black Africans most often arrived in Venice enslaved. Owning and trading in slaves uh, were regular and regulated facts of Venetian life and commerce. They were usually sold into domestic service, with Ethiope, Ethiope being the word generally and generically applied to those black household slaves, or servants as they might have become. And I show you a such a survey person uh, in the background uh, to uh, a picture of Christ watching the feet of, feet of the disciples uh, by Paolo Veronese, now in Prague. These slave, the slaves were uh, usually or customarily freed at the death of their owners or after a number of years of service. A minority population, black Africans were nonetheless part of the cityscape and the life of the lagoon. I show you details from uh, with Gondo with the Black Gondolier, a detail from the Miracle of the Relic of True Cross by Carpaccio, uh, and from about 1496, and on the right, a detail from Gentile Benini's True Cross, 
miracle, uh, 1500, where a man is preparing to jump from the window um, into the lagoon uh, in order to work on saving the cross. Both are in the Galleria della Academia, Academia in Venice. Um, fought free or not, uh, they engage in occupations ranging from domestic service to gondolier. And this again, this is here I really do refer you again to Kate Lowe's work on the subject. In those ways, they were a regular part of Titian's visual field and perhaps his artistic curiosity. Oops, sorry. Do you see? These are not drawings by Titians, they are drawings instead uh, by, attributed to Veronese. One on the left was sold at Sotheby's in 2007, and the other on the right, it's in the Musée des Beaux Arts in Rome. But it just shows you the availability of such models uh, to Venetian artists. While skin color was a manifest discriminator, the fluctuating descriptors found in the sources, more Saracen, Ethiopian, and others, indicate that foreignness remained a defining quality of those people. Largely indifferent to actual and quite disparate origins, this generalized grouping was nonetheless value-laden. While not fixing on one racial stereotype, perceptions and projections could refer to multiple, even contradictory, associations. It is also important to note that however identified, those blacks were not called African. If Africans as a class did not exist for Titian and his contemporaries, the continent of Africa was coming into increasing focus. Knowledge of foreign parts was essential to Venetian commerce, along with the city's cultural prestige, particularly as its actual maritime dominance diminished. One of the great publishing centers of Europe, the city was also a center of information about recent discoveries, cartographic and ethnographic. Among the most monumental influ and influential of travel books was the three-volume anthology, first published between 1550 and 1559, the Navigazione e Viaggi, collected, edited, and uh, commented on by Giovanni Battista Ramuzio. The first volume to appear is largely dedicated to travel accounts, and I'll show you one of the title pages, of Africa and its inhabitants. But Amuzio, however, did not discount the fabulous and incredible. He cited both the ancient writers and the seemingly unbelievable things being reported by modern travelers, yet proven to be true when things were imported in, back into Europe. And the, all these and other, like in these and other books, ethnographic, economic, and political information about Africa based on observation was mixed with legendary lore and continued allegiance to ancient writers. Now, without turning Titian into an ethnographer, this hybrid vision provided the framework to the Venetian comprehension of the continent, one which situates Titian's work within a cultural production that was profoundly and profitably engaged with Africa in ways that not only increased knowledge, but sparked imagination. At once alien and domesticated, by Titian's day, Ethiopes had been assimilated into the pictorial population. While being a sporadic presence in his work, they are notable because the majority were neither conventionally required nor expected iconographically. The first makes a shadowy appearance in the altarpiece that Titian painted for the Bishop of Paphos, Jacopo Pizarro, and Jacopo's brothers between 1519 and 1526. Held captive, and I'll show you a detail, by a knight in gleaming armor. In gleaming armor, he looks anxiously towards his fellow prisoner, another exotic, presumably Turkish, a turbaned man with a bowed head. Both of these Moors, in the sense of Muslim or pagan and black Moor, are ethnically distinguished by their features, their skin color, and by attributes. The turban on the bearded man bearded and mustachioed, mustachioed man, and the earring worn by the Ethiop. You can just see it there, dangling below his ear. The painting is the focal point of the chapel dedicated to the Immaculate Virgin in the Franciscan Church of Santa Maria dei Frari. The endowment, which dates from January 1518, 
also granted the rights to construct a floor tomb for the family and a wall tomb specifically for Jacopo fitting to his state. And you can see the entire ensemble with uh, Jacopo's tomb on the right. There are a number of intersecting interests and tensions that can be associated with the Frari bequest and Titian's astonishing syn synthesis in the altarpiece. The most relevant here is the coincidence with Pope Leo X's futile attempts to rouse the great European powers to a crusade, in a venture that was, however, supported by the conventional friars of the Friary. The Turkish threat to the Christian West was very real at the time, with major incursions into European territories. The Ottoman Empire encompassed the Mamluk domains in Egypt and the Levant and the Palestinian towns in the Holy Land, formerly under Franciscan control. Uh, in fact, it was the head of the Franciscans at Frari who would have been the, uh, notionally in charge of those Palestinian lands, so they had a really quite personal stake in this problem. The epitaph, which I show you on the right, um, on Jacopo's tomb, proudly records the fact that he was victorious against the Turks. The bishop had previously memorialized, memorialized that victory in a form of votive image by Titian, showing Pope Alexander VI presenting him to St. Peter, now in Antwerp. The victory in question occurred on the 30th of August in 1502, when, given command of the papal fleet by Alexander, Jacopo participated in the taking of the Corsair Fortress of Santa Maura on the Ionian island of Lefkada. And then you can sort of see him, well, one of the ships, uh, first galleys, and the picture of the island there in the background. In a detailed account of the event, Jacopo claimed that the seizing of that pirate's nest, as he called it, should be credited in large measure to the papal forces led by him. Along with other reports, he noted that the Turks fled in disarray when they saw the Christian banners flying. The papal Borgia banner with Pesaro arms grasped by Jacopo in his votive picture, and by the night behind him in the altarpiece portrays the standard of the command, which was donated to the Frari and actually flew on, was hung on, on feast days. The triumph was short-lived, the triumph of Santa Maura. The island was returned to the Turks a year after its capture, and its significance, the very battle of their capture, was doubted by many. But for Jacopo, it seems that the role of militant Christian and defender of the faith against Turkish dogs, as he called them, his infidel foes, was definitive. So too were his undial loyalty to the more usually reliable Pope, Borgia Pope, and his dedication to the Holy See in the person of St. Peter. You can see. Um, in the altarpiece, Jacopo kneels devoutly before the Virgin and Peter. He's no, Peter who becomes his notional advocate or intercessor, looking towards him. Instead of holding his <coughs> keys, as is usual or customary, the saint points, as he did also in the other uh, painting by Titian, to passages in his book. The keys are at his feet, only one visible, dangling over the stair, pointing towards Jacopo. I think this precarious position of the keys is rather interesting and relates to some of these tensions that are here, that are here in the being resolved here. But anyway, you have this dangly key. But the emphasis on the saint's book probably stems from the fact that the first epistle of Peter is addressed to the chosen pilgrims of the Christian diaspora, the elect in lands in Asia Minor, which in Titian's day coincided with the Ottoman domains. It seems to be an assertion of orthodoxy and of the crusading mission. Rather than patron saint, the knight behind Jacopo, who has no halo, it seems, can be seen as a form of alter ego, where there's been various attempts to identify him as a saint, perhaps, uh, one that could also be seen as a form of alter ego, representing Jacopo's role as defender of the faith. The possibility of conversion along with conquest might be suggested by the two captives. The dress of both is dignified, even costly. The turban man wears a gold-threaded cloak. The young man has a button-down doublet, 
in what seems to be good, even fine cloth, and it seems like the same costume as that worn by the king in the adoration of the Magi. Neither is abject, although subjected to domination, by the armored knight, who looks towards the black moor captive with his arm twisted around as though leading him by his bound hands. In one way the two can be seen in that way as human trophies, Jacopo's tributary offerings to the Virgin and Christ and to St. Peter, but they could also be more than spoils of war, representing instead or as well, the potential reach of the universal faith into conquered lands. The inclusion of the Ethiop in particular may recognize the extension of Ottoman control over areas of northern Africa identified as Ethiopian. It might also have been inspired by the fact that the word Maura, Santa Maura, meant both Moorish and Black. Now, what diverted Titian's attention from Jacopo Pizarro's prestigious commission, which took seven years to deliver, that is 1519 to 26? Doubtless, a key factor was pressure from an even more prestigious patron, the Duke of Ferrara, Alfonso d'Este. Titian's work for the Duke centered on the mythological paintings for Alfonso's study, the Camerino della Bastro. Here, the three painted between 1516 and 24 but it came to include a number of other tasks that Alfonso really couldn't stop thinking of things for Titian to do. And here I show you the Worship of Venus in the Prado, the Bacchus and Ariadne in the National Gallery, and the Andrians also in the Prado, the three done in this time span. The subjects of the studio of paintings were suited to Alfonso's well-known amorous pursuits. Widowed in 1519 and still in his prime, age 43, the Duke did not seek another dynastic marriage. But according to his later biographer, Paolo Giovio, being lusty and liking sex, he found abstinence detrimental and bothersome. And in due course, went shopping for someone to satisfy his appetites on a regular basis. <coughs> Probably around 1526, so the date is uncertain, Alfonso settled upon a young woman of modest origins, a hat maker's daughter, captivated by her beautiful face, as he stated in a document from January 1530. There he also says that she was a well brought up virgin, of honest parents, and that in negotiating with them, he promised the deal would be to the advantage of both, of all concerned. As it was, and as was usual in such cases of court con concubinage. The fetching girl became known as the Signora Laura Dianti, called Eustochia, names probably given by the Duke along with properties to her and her family, though some still referred to her as La Bertara, that is, the uh, hat maker's daughter. Alfonso's captivation by Laura is manifested in the portrait he commissioned from Titian. A picture of imposing scale, it's in slightly not terribly wonderful condition, but of imposing scale and material sumptuousness, and signed by the artist on her armband. It's now in a private collection in Switzerland, and also like the discovery of Laura, Laura and un, of uncertain date. The commission is a mark of her favorite position, and prima favorita was one term assigned to the recognized mistresses in ducal and princely households. Titian's treatment of his sitter mediates her identity. Every aspect of her dress is splendid, representing fine and costly fabrics, a pearl studded and badge bedecked headdress, pearl uh, and pearl earrings. But neither her jewelry or her garments are as lavish as the jewel encrusted turban, uh, ermine wrap, and gold embroidered sleeves we depicted when portraying somewhat later the Duchess of Mantua and Alfonso's sister, Isabella d'Este, prim and dignified. Laura's dress is, however, also in a state of undress, not quite as exposed as one of Titian's earlier beauties, but tending in that direction. Um, both the, uh, the, the, the La Bella, the portrait, the um, young lady in the middle, the Flora, she called, is in Uffizi, and Isabella d'Este is in Vienna. Laura is further accessorized by the presence of the young page bearing a pair of embroidered gloves, another luxury object. He wears a silken, if not silk, striped livery, arguably attributes um, 
The strikes had some association with black African service servants. Here, for example, a detail of the page or the, in the young oh, sorry, the page to the youngest magi in an adoration by Domenico Gil and Dio, now in the Uffizi. Looking up at his mistress with anticipatory gaze, his profile uh, features a hooped earring with a gleaming pink tinted pendant. As desirable in his way as Laura, black children were thought sought after possessions at the Este and Gonzaga courts. Familiar places tradition who was often in demand of both, often spent time specifically uh, at the Este court and uh, working on the working for Alfonso, uh, but also for the Gonzaga in Mantua. In a letter written by Isabella Deste to her agent in Mantua, for example, she asked that he obtain a Moreta, a young girl about four or eight years of age for her, as black as possible. She added that she could not be more pleased with an older girl that had already she had already, even if she were blacker, she would if, even if she had been blacker, because from being a, first a little disdainful, she's now become pleasing in word and acts, and we think she will make the best buffoon in the world. This matter of fact statement reveals how such how those Moors uh, were classified in courts. Like dwarves, they could be fondly uh, regarded retainers, but they were categories as pleasing and serviceable monsters. Titian's decision to include the black child in his portrait of Duke Alfonso's mistress was likely informed by the presence of such attendants, buffoons at the for Ferrara court, registering an actual role if not portraying an actual person. The child's features are closely observed, however, as though Titian was was intrigued as to how to convincingly depict dark skin and tightly curled black hair. His alert expression and his tender cheeks, softly rounded chin, and are carefully studied. His position is not perfunctory in its physicality or in the uh, pictorial complexity of his foreshortened arm. He is posed as though he's been gently stopped from moving away holding out the gloves, allowing for Laura's elegant hands to be shown. In the position of an attribute, the child signifies acquired pleasure, his role a reminder of hers. The specificity, the specificity of the inclusion of the page, servant, exotic possession, and marker of Laura's own status as a desirable possession is proven by the fact that about 30 years passed before Ethiopians reappear in Titian's paintings, allowing for survival and, you know, plus or minus in the dates. They do so in different capacities in a cluster of works dating from the mid-1550s to the end of the decade, and subsequently as serving boys in paintings of Judith and Salome. And I will look at those, show you those, some of those first. Um, dated approximately to the first years of the 1570s, late 1560s to the first years of the 1570s. In those cases, they assist uh, the heroines in displaying their gruesome trophies. They may also indicate the Middle Eastern setting of the respective beheadings, uh, 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 that is, in the um, biblical Bethulia for Ju Judith on your far right, uh, and in this Dead Sea region of Jordan for Salome the first two. One is in a collection in Switzerland and the other in Tokyo. Not directly stenciled from previous works, the, the subservient page entered Titian's portfolio as a serviceable motif deployed to various pictorial effects and chromatic skill. The painting of Judith is perhaps, which is now in Detroit, the most subtly conceived in that aspect, with an interplay of gold and brown against an array of dashing bright white and rose-tinted flesh. Juxtapositions amplified, emphasized by the contrast of the pearl necklace and pear drop earring against her cheek and, neck, and her cheek and neck, uh, whereas the page boy has a vermilion-tinted earring with a glass ball catching the light and still showing his tawny skin. A bravura touch, which is also consistent, consistent with Titian's marking of his Ethiopes. 
Those pictures were preceded by Titian's portrait of the wealthy merchant Fabrizio Saboresa. Now in the Quincistorius Museum in Vienna, the picture is signed and dated 1558, giving the sitter's age. Giving the sitter's age is 50. Although resident in Venice, Saboresa was not a Venetian citizen. The family came from the village of Saboresa near Genoa, and its members were dispersed between Venice, Genoa, and Messina. Their business was largely in trade with the Ottoman Empire and included some dealing in slaves. At the time of the portrait, Fabrizio had imported large quantities of grain from regions uh, near Bosnia, supplying Venice at a time of shortage. This service to the state might account for the fact that Titian took on the task of portraying Saboresa at a time when he was largely engaged with works for the King of Spain. Saboresa is portrayed in his character a prosperous but foreign merchant, unhampered by the regulated dress of Venetian citizenry. So we have um, from Vecchio his merchant costume, which he uses several times over as a template for the merchant, which is different, however, from the far right, the Venetian merchant. Shades of black, white, and gold are the chromatic keynotes of the picture, inflected to represent the different textures and materials of his expensive garments. The striped gold embroidered sash sounds a flashy and orientalizing note. Salvaresa's chubby grasp adds swagger to his pose. The clock by his head, resting on a swathe of velvet, may allude to the passage of time, a memento mori for a man past middle age, but it is also a luxurious object, just like the eager serving boy in gold livery, all adding up to an ostentatious, ostentatious assemblage of attributes. There's almost a superfluity. The little boy holds a clutch of posies at the level of Salvares's genitals, a slight sort of offering in the context of such luxury. In the painting's present state, Salvares's Ethiop has lost both his ear and his earring that one might expect. However, and I show you a sort of detail of the edge which has been stretched and it really is hard to read if there was ever anything under there. However, Oh, sorry, let's go forward. No, not that far forward. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I had it for you. Um, however, it's clearly visible uh, in in the um, print made for the Theatrum Pictorium or the Theatre of Painting, the illustrated catalog of the collection of the Archduke Leopold, Archduke Wil Leopold Wilhelm, published in 15, 1658. This is an unlikely detail, this earring, for the engraver to add to a reproduction that, excepting for the reversal, is faithful in all other ways. With or without earring, should return to the whole, x-rays show the Titian that the servant was planned from the outset. I don't have the x-ray, but he was always going to be there as a pictorial prop, a sign of Salvares' affluence, and with his trivializing bouquet, perhaps of Titian's attitude to a not totally sympathetic sitter. If the young servant, the eager Ethiop, becomes formulaic in Titian's studio, the Ethiopians in the paintings Titian sent to Philip II are deliberate. The most conspicuous is the maidservant hasting to cover the goddess Diana from the uh, hunter Actian's invasive presence in the picture that Titian called Diana at at the fountain, surprised by Actaeon, when sending it to, to Philip in 1559. The, the picture now, as you know, is now shared, shared between the National Galleries in London and Edinburgh. The phrase paraphrases, his, the way he calls it when he's sending it uh, and talking about it to uh, Philip, accounts of that fateful moment found in all three of the translations of Ovid's Metamorphoses that were available to Titian. The solicitous gesture is not described in any of them, but the illustration of Callisto uh, being exposed to Diana's gaze in Niccolo degli Agostino's edition, published first in 1522, but then often thereafter, after may have been suggestive. It has the same compositional, uh, let's say, skeleton um, with someone entering on the on the, your left and things happening involving clothing on the right. That's sort of paradoxical, since there might be 
that he might have it had it to hand since he was simultaneously working on a pendant composition of the story of Callisto. Ludovico Dolce's, however, rendering of the fountain episode in his book of Ovid's Transformations, published in 1553, however, expanded the bathing interlude to include Diana's nymphs tending to the goddess, disrobing her, removing her shoes, and drawing water to sprinkle her beautiful and exposed body. But Titian did not need any text to know that Diana's entourage consisted entirely of nymphs. She did not go hunting with a household staff nor did she in the picture when Titian began to paint it. The light white visible in the X-radiograph and other technical uh, information shows that the attendant figure was originally intended to be a fair-skinned nymph. And you can see this particularly in the arm that is crossing over Diana in the original underdrawing. In making this change uh, from uh, or something suggestive to Titian in this composition for this change and others, was a recollection of Sodomus' painting of the bridal chamber of Alexander and Roxanne, which decorated Alexander Kiji's bedchamber in his suburban villa in Rome, now known after its former, later owners as the Farnesina. That mural was based on a famous painting of antiquity described by the second century philosopher and satirist Lucian of Samosata. The central motif of the great beauty um, Roxanne, troubled by the presence of Alexander, while Amorini pull away her veil and draw off her sandals, is echoed in the passage on Diana's bath in Dolce's transformations, and possibly not without uh, knowingly, possibly knowingly, which Titian anyway chose to include that episode and illustrate it. And I show you actually a comparison of Titian's underdrawing, particularly the way the Amorino's drawing his arm across and the whole notion of feet uh, involvement in the two paintings. Lucian's, not in Lucian's ekphrasis any more than it was in Ovid's verses, is the Ethiopian added to the attendance in both pictures. Whether or not prompted by this recollection of his Roman sur sojourn some seven years before he began work on the Diana painting, <clears throat> Titian's eye-catching inclusion of the anomalous figure in his poesia was aimed specifically toward Philip's discerning gaze. Philip was a man for detail, as is frequently mentioned in Venetian reports, from his court, often exasperated by the fact that he was doing the details and not getting to the bigger picture. Anyway, Titian had cause to know about Philip's character and tastes, having met him in Milan in 1549 and spent time in his court in Augsburg a year or a year later, painting the prince's, among other things, painting the prince's portrait and probably actually receiving the commission for the mythological paintings. He corresponded personally with the king and vice versa. Uh, he was acquainted with the Spanish ambassadors in Venice, he actually portrayed one, and was virtually hounded by their secretary, Garcia Hernandez, who continually, Titian says, kept his eye on the progress of the work on this and other paintings, and who saw to their safe shipping. So whatever the maid might mean within the imagery of the painting, she was meant to add to Philip's viewing pleasure, one of Titian's explicit concerns for his poesie. Why might Philip have been delighted or amused by the carefully portrayed serving woman? Her muscled body, negroid features, striped dress, and her jewelry, jewelry specifically the vermilion-tinted earring, single out her characterization as servant or even slave, and as the type of being who, like Laura Ustokia's page, Laura Diante's page, would have been counted among the court's collection of monsters. Philip, who controlled the global commerce in African slaves, is documented as having them in his entourage. He also had a reputation for enjoying the company of jesters, dwarves, and buffoons, his principal form of relaxation and dinnertime amusement. And just to show you the way that uh, I think this, um, the juxtaposition of the servant and Titian's painting with Diana's lapdog, both, lap dog, both responding in the painting to, in their way, the maid and the lapdog to Actian's arrival with his hunting dog, is an amusing narrative device, but it also affirms the association with court pets. And I show you how in Andrea del Sarto's 
uh, tribute to Caesar at Poggio Caiano, he assembles a dog with a door with a monkey, uh, uh, in a sense of the same series of associations and classifications. Does uh, the motif have greater significance? Is the Ethio merely a painterly device, her dark skin setting off Diana's flesh tones? Or does she represent the other side of the moon as she seeks to cover the goddess who wears a crescent crown? Is she a form of pictorial eclipse? Could a slave be equivalent to a goddess? There is certainly a form of visual pun in the shattering of Diana. If intended to appeal to the lunar imagination of the day, the figure might connect to the notion of the moon as representing other worlds, those beyond the known world, an idea dating from antiquity and one that still applied to the mysterious regions of sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa. In that sense, her presence could represent a complement to Philip's imperial command at a time when he was much concerned with the importation of black African slaves to the New World territories, the Spanish New World territories. The ether is but one element in a rich, violistic episode designed with the king's interest in mind. As has been frequently noted, seeing and being seen are organizing principles of the painting. Emblematized at its center uh, by the mirror and crystal vase at the very center. Both, of course, like the picture itself, were Venetian products. And Venetian glass, like Titian's paintings, was highly prized by Philip. He owned over 300 pieces, drank from Venetian crystal, and had special cabinets made to display the best from this collection. Indeed, a shipment of Murano glass, well packed and bound, we are told, <coughs> accompanied Titian's painting when it was sent to Philip. The Ethiop's earring is also likely to represent Venetian artifice. Glass beads were a staple of Venetian production. It is not shaped like a carved gemstone of ruby or garnet. Its pear drop shape indicates that it is more than likely a colored glass bead of the type known in Venice as perla or margarita. Venetian glass beads had long been produced as forms of counterfeit finery, uh, substitutes for actual gems in jeweled settings and in jeweled study clothing. clothing. But the ever-rising African and Atlantic trade traffic produced a boom in bead production. Glass beads became a staple among the wares traded in Africa for, among other goods, captives for the slave market. Now, there's a second Ethiopian. In Titian's Poesie, the princess Andromeda bound to the rock, as Titian called the Poesie that he painted for between 1554 and 1556, now in the Wallace collection. The illustrations to both Giovanni Monsignori's and Niccolò degli Agostino's editions of Ovid provided points of departure for Titian's picturing of her plight and of Perseus's swooping assault on the sea monster sent by Poseidon to devour her. But Dolce's verses in his adaptation once again seem to have supplied the phrase Titian used to describe the subject and which, unlike the others, was faithful to Ovid's description of Perseus flying over Ethiopia and seeing how, seeing her fastened by her arms to the hard rock, he would have believed she was a marble statue had he not seen tears starting from her eyes. The metaphor provided a challenge to the painter who depicted a statuesque figure brilliant in his pallor. Yet Andromeda is a statue rendered flesh with soft contours and rose skin. Nude but for the improbable wisp of drapery that drops from her raised hand over her shoulder, along her flanks and sweeps over conveniently her genitals, the monster's victim is presented so that the beholder might replicate Perseus's infatuation without <coughs> having to plunge into the sea, however. That except visually. That nudity in the previous illustrations and explicitly mentioned by Dolce likely added to the attraction of the subject to Titian and as he surely hoped, for Philip. Andromeda's sole adornment is a single translucent earring hanging against the pale skin of her neck and cheek, the pink tone echoing the blush of her ears and face. The turn of her head towards Perseus makes the jewel conspicuous. With the detail, Titian linked her to his other Ethiopians. 
Now, it is of course possible that he decided that an opaque pearl earring would not have this have shown against Andromeda's flesh. That was, however, hardly a problem in the case of his other light-skinned beauties that I showed you earlier, who sport opaque pearls. The difference seems to be a form of distinction. The choice of bead can be seen to associate Andromeda with the land of her origin, a legendary Ethiopia. Titian's Ariosto, Titian's sensitivity to place not only resonates with the meticulously charted adventures of Ariosto's heroes, but also with Dolce's unusual inclusion of a world map at the beginning of his book of transformations. The prefatory map is, is striking not only for its presence, but also for its combination of the venerable Macrobian type of hemispheric map with the delineation of Europe and the southern tip of Africa based on Giacomo Gastaldi's 1548 edition of Ptolemy's Geography. This blend of sources creates a modern antiquity, like Dolce and Titian's textual and visual translations. Dolce's map accounts with accords with Ovid's worldview, establishing a poetic geography that, subtly, that is subtly acknowledged by Titian in his Parisier. By way of conclusion, Titian's African anthology spans over 15 year, 50 years of his career and corresponds with a half a century of the exploration and exploitation of that continent and its material and human resources. Occasional as they may be, the variety of roles played by those essentially exotic figures in Titian's paintings reveal the types and stereotypes that formed an ethnographic other to, be, to an assumed dominant norm. Moorish captive, courtly curiosity, household servant, oriental king, Ethiopian princess, subjects of myth and legend, of actual political and religious concern, and of commercial interest. They represent the prized and the despised, the distanced and the domesticated. They reveal the fluctuating boundaries between the mapped and the imaginate and the imagined continent, and the overlap between traditional or classical concepts of Africa and those based on recent knowledge. Some immediate and observed, others reduced to formula, Titian's Ethiopes are marked as such by the jewels hanging from their ears. Those jewels be they precious stones or glass beads, tinged pink or red, collectively represent the artist's unique pictorial responses to contemporary forms of cultural definition and ethnic discrimination. <laughs>